Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we are looking at a concept which I certainly found myself just talking about as if everyone knows what I'm talking about and I think uh, they probably don't. So I think it's probably worth going back to basics and having a look at what we call flank companies. So in this video we're going to look at what a flank company actually is, what their roles were and what did they, you know, what, why were they a thing? Now before we get started properly, I'd like to thank everyone that joined me for the two live streams we had last weekend. I think they were really good fun. The Road to Waterloo continues, although I'm not sure it's going to be ready for June the 18th, as I've just taken on another massive project as well. So that may not end up happening, but that's fine, you know, as long as we're getting there. And, you know, anyone who wants to watch the live streams, anything like that, please make sure you're subscribed, because I don't always announce a huge amount of time ahead I'm doing the live streams and it's mainly because I haven't decided until like two or three days before so if you do want to like possibly watch one of these then please subscribe click the bell icon so you'll know when I put out messages I also often put out a message if an episode is going to be delayed or cancelled for any reason so if you just want to keep up with what's happening with the channel or you don't want to make sure you don't miss any videos then please subscribe. I also have a join function as well, so that's another way you can support the channel. And I do have a Patreon. I haven't really looked at it for a long time. I've had one, but never really done anything with it. But uh, I may stick a link in the description down below. So if you do want to help support the channel, then um, that's down there for you. But anyway, with all that shilling out of the way, let us get on with the episode. So let's start with the most obvious place to start. Uh, <laughs> it seems reasonable to me. And that is, what actually do I mean by the term flank company? Now, if you've seen my video on company to core, where we discuss all the different sizes of formations, you'll know that the companies were the basic building blocks of a battalion. The, and a battalion is, is you know, it's our basic unit that we use in black powder. And these were the companies that would be on each end of the battalion when it was in line. The so-called flanks. Now, different nations have different numbers of companies per battalion. Uh, the French had uh, eight until 1808, and then they had six until Waterloo. Whilst the British had ten pretty much all the way through. Those are just two examples. Now, these are the nations we're going to talk about the most in this video, because they, by and large kept their flank companies with their parent battalions. Don't worry too much if you know, that doesn't make any sense at the moment. We'll get into that as we go on. Also, these flank companies were called elite companies. I mean, not <laughs> let's, let's be honest, not least by themselves. And that's because they were expected to have a higher standard of skills, ability, and training. Now, the most common of these flank companies was the Grenadier Company. Most nations had one of these in their battalions. And the other type was the Light Company. And they were mainly employed by the British and French and were heavily inspired by their use, or well, not their use, but their requirement in the French Indian Wars, which took place in the 18th century. Although they were both considered the elite of the battalion, we're going to talk about them one at a time, and I think we'd best start off with the Light Company. The light companies were made up of the smallest and most agile men in the battalion, perfect for the type of fighting they carried out. In the French army, for instance, the minimum height for a light company recruit was set at 4 foot 11, or 159.9 centimetres. There you go. Although the minimum requirement was lower in light battalions, so in leger regiments. Now that's pretty small, but even so, recruits would be eventually be admitted that failed to even meet that height requirement. Remember, back in the day, people were a lot smaller than we are now. Of all the armies of the Napoleonic period, the British and the French were the ones who kept their light companies with their battalions. The British called their light companies light companies. <laughs> not, no, not entirely surprising there. But the French called them leger. Now, if you were in a light infantry battalion, so the French in particular had a number of light infantry designated regiments, then in a light infantry battalion, the light company would be known as Voltigeurs or Voltigeur. As you know, my pronunciations are absolutely appalling. Never, <laughs> never take my pronunciation for it. I'm going to go with Voltigeur because it sounds more French to my northern British ear. Now, they were called this because it's a literal translation of Volta. Well, you know, it's, not, it's the French word for Volta. Uh, because it was said that in order to qualify as a Voltigeur, one had to leap onto the back of a horse fully laden. So that's with your musket, your cartridge pouch, and your backpack. 
Now, I'm not entirely sure how <laughs> how often that happened, but that's that's certainly the story anyway. And you know that on this channel, we love ourselves a bit of mythology around the period. It certainly makes it a lot more interesting. Now, I'm probably in this video going to refer to the light companies for the French as Voltigeurs. So if you hear the word Voltigeur, assume I'm talking about Leger as well, unless I specifically say that I'm not. Now, I hinted at earlier on that these troops may be required to do things that were a little different from the norm for the rest of their line brethren. And, you know, what would those tasks be? Well, they would vary depending on what the battalion was up to at the time and whereabouts it was on the column of march. But the light company would often provide picket, they would scout ahead to make sure that they weren't about to be ambushed, and also, particularly for the foraging French, they would scout out farms or villages where they can find food and, shall we say, acquire said food. They might also um, hunt things like rabbits or small game like that as well, just to add a bit of variety for the troops. And they would also provide an advanced picket for the troops when they were in camp. So stopping the enemy from infiltrating their positions, and they would also try and infiltrate the enemy's positions. Of course, the other useful thing about the picket as well is it stops people leaving your camping area, especially if they're, shall we say, not quite as dedicated to the cause as you are. Let's, uh, let's put it that way. We're going to come again to speak about how having Voltigeurs and Grenadiers, your two elite flank companies, how that can help, shall we say, strengthen people's resolve. We'll come to that in a bit later. I should also say as well that whenever I talk about the French, now this is a more general point, but uh, I think it's important here. I'm not just talking about the French themselves, I'm talking about anyone who used the French organisational method. So that's things like the Italians in particular, the Kingdom of Naples, I, 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 the Neapolitans, I was told off for not calling them uh, the other week, so uh, the Kingdom of Naples, the Duchy of Warsaw, Westphalia, any of these places, Bavaria, any of these places that took on the French organisation, whenever I talk about France, I'm talking about those nations as well. So if you collect one of those nations, don't think I'm not talking about you guys, I am as well, I just use the term French because it's a catch-all term. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely talking about those countries as well. Now, obviously, as with any soldiers, their main use is in battle. Well, I say their main use, where the rubber meets the road is in battle. And in battle, their duties would be to skirmish ahead of the main line. Now, it varies whether you're in attack or defence, what you, what you do with that skirmishing. But ultimately, it doesn't matter either way. You're looking to take out enemy officers, particularly if you're a rifle-armed light company. So the French wouldn't have been. The British probably wouldn't have been either, but their rifles operated very similarly to a light company, as they were often handed out in penny packets. But even something like the Bavarians, they had rifle-armed flank company troops as well. And the idea there is just to, to create confusion in the enemy and break down the cohesion of their ranks. If they're attacking, then this can often cause the attack to stall, or if they're defending, it can weaken the enemy before your troops arrive. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, they considered themselves elite companies, and so there is a difference in uniforms as well. Now, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this video, is I see a lot of people asking about what figures go where when they're on their sprues. Now, if you did see the live streams the other day, you'll see that we were doing the French... Uh, sorry, no, we were doing the British uh, Warlord sprues, although they're actually going to be Americans. And... On that sprue, you've got a guy with big shoulder pads on, and then you've got a spare set of shoulder pads. Now, these were called nests at the time, and those are for you to designate your British flank companies. Victrix do a box of flank companies, and it's just the arms with these nests on. Everything else is exactly the same. They've just changed the arms. For the French, however, they had a slightly different um, look on their uniforms. Well, quite a different look. They had epaulettes instead of just a tab, and they also carried a short sabre called a briquette. Now, the epaulets could be green or yellow as well. I've also seen red ones as well. I think that was more to do with the voltigeurs if in the light battalions rather than their leger brethren. But, uh, yeah, they, they, they generally went with the epaulets, and the briquette is the other thing. So, again, if you're looking at a box of French infantry, for argument's sake, the Perrys, then the guys with the epaulets, they get the backpacks with the sabres on, and those are your flank companies. Now, flank companies for the British and the French, 
He also had different coloured plumes on their shakos or their bike horns. The British would often have green and their shako cords would be green as well. Now the shako cords are the, the sort of braided bits that hang, or, hang off the shako. They'd be green as well. For the French, there was a little bit more leeway. They would often have yellow or yellow and green or red and green. I've seen a huge variety of different colours. And they would also sometimes wear busbies as well, particularly early on. Uh, busby's sort of like a sawn off bear skin and this really played into their their association with light cavalry they consider themselves sort of the hussars of the foot as if i want of a better term light infantry officers very similarly would also carry light infantry swords which would be curved sabers rather than the straight swords that regular line infantry and grenadiers would carry another thing with the light infantry and this will be the same with the grenadiers is look for the figures for the french anyway who've got cross straps so their straps make an x across their chest because it's that second strap that holds that little saber the briquette that we were talking about earlier on so that's another way of identifying them on the spruce they've got cross straps then their flank company if they've just got the single strap then they are a center company being the flank companies they do go on the end of the battalions and the light company forms up on the left hand side of the battalion so if you're stood behind your guys looking at the enemy then your left hand side of the line should be the light company now rules wise this has no real effect you put them wherever you want but for me it just it just adds a little bit of visual element there on the left if the battalion is in column of march then they go at the front and because so they can skirmish out and things like that now this one's just for the french and french aligned players out there if you're in column of attack then they are at the back on the left hand side not the front they're at the back on the left hand side now they're at the back for three main reasons the first one was they would help drive the column forward by having these elite troops at the back they were less likely to be staggered by the enemy's fire pushing their frankly bullet catching brothers forward <laughs> Speaking of which, it also put the maximum amount of bodies between the enemy's bullets and your elite troopers, meaning that when they did get to the enemy, you had maximum top-skilled, top-experienced dudes alive, and you could deliver that fire or that bayonet charge back with more efficiency. Most armies throughout history have divided their lines of troops by their age and experience. You think of the famous Triplex Asis, of Republican Rome, you've got the Hastati at the front, you've got the Principe in the middle, and then you've got the experienced Grizzle Triarii at the back. And to show that it wasn't just a Western culture thing, the Zulus had something very similar. You've got the unmarried Braves at the front, and then you've got the different ranks, and then you've got the married warriors at the back, overseeing everything and making sure that everything's going to plan. And if it's not, then they can provide that reserve, which just adds that extra bit of steel into their ranks the third reason is that by being at the back when you were skirmishing at the front you could skirmish to the last minute you could let the column physically pass through your skirmish line and then quickly form up at the back and you got the maximum amount of skirmishy action before you had to form up with the battalion you know you'd be firing away the battalion would be marching through you'd hear your bugle and then you'd form up at the back of the column speaking of which a, a nice fun little addition you can have to your troops is the addition of a bugler now there are some companies out there that sell separate models front rank a good one for that another really good one for that is eagle miniatures now i actually have a bugler in my uh, red battalion of the buffs for the british and he's from eagle miniatures now they are quite a bit smaller than the perrys but that's fine because as we saw earlier on the light company guys were small anyway and the buglers musicians drummers etc they were often boys anyway now you didn't have drummers in light battalion light companies sorry that often but they did have them it's important to point out that it wasn't just bugles they did have drums as well or even fifers if you're looking at a central european nation but it's just a little bit of fun really and i don't know why but i absolutely hate painting drummers it's just i hate drummers so it's a nice change for that as well a slight variation on this and i want to point it out because i don't mean to think i've forgotten about them but it's not hugely relevant here so i'm just going to skip over it are the prussians now they use their third rank as skirmish screen so do the austrians but to a lesser extent than the prussians 
and they would skirmish in front of the battalion. Although it's better than nothing, they didn't possess the self-assured nature or the training of the dedicated light companies. They do have similar rules in Black Powder, but without the option to separate them off into a combined company. Which, I have to say, I often criticise the rules in Black Powder. Although I, I, you know, I love the game, I'll often say, oh, I'm not sure about this rule or that rule, because if the rule's good, you don't really need to talk about it, do you? In this case, I think that's a really, really good rule. Hats off to the writer for this one. Because while these battalions did have some training, and they, you know, their skirmishing would be effective, they certainly wouldn't have been effective away from their parent battalion. So, really, really good idea. Really happy with that. So, having looked at light companies, who they were and what they did, how do they operate in game? Well, in Black Powder, a battalion that has a light company as part of it allows the unit to have the mixed order special rule, which means that they can have skirmishing troops out in front and they're minus one to be hit. They, they present an obscured target. Now, that's a solid buff. That's really strong. Now, some people, if they're skirmishing out, they're skirmishing in front, they'll take off their light company and replace it with skirmishing figures in front of their battalion. And that's super, super awesome. In fact, in the Perry's original box, uh, you get the skirmishes in addition to the 36 men. And I also think in the... Well, if I don't think I know. In their mid-war box, you get enough for the 36 men, but you also get the two sprues of their elite companies as well. So you can make some skirmishing skirmishes as well. It also gives you the bear skins and the... the tall plume shakos to make the light company heads when they're marching as well well i, I, I say light company the bear skins are for the grenadier company but we'll get come on to those guys in a second now i have to say although this is by far the coolest way of doing it i i tend not to and it's purely laziness i've just painted 36 guys to form a battalion and i don't know what it is i just really resent painting another six as skirmishes i shouldn't do really it's it's I mean, it's, it's only six more figures or four more for the british but i don't know i, I don't know what it is it, i just hate i just don't want to do them. something else that can be a bit of fun when you're doing your light companies is something that i do because they were would do a lot more stuff than your center companies as i said earlier on they're doing patrols they're doing picket duty all that kind of stuff their uniforms and their clothes would wear out a lot quicker than the others so i like to mix in the odd brown great coat or two or three pairs of brown trousers or whatever and i put those in the light company just to show that their clothes have worn out a little bit quicker again doesn't add anything to the game i just it just varies it up a little bit and it's just a nice little nod on the tabletop to these guys being maybe a little bit more active than the rest of the battalion so having talked about the light company we now turn our attention to the other flank and we look at what's my favorite company actually and that is the grenadier companies now we talked pretty much exclusively about the french and british when it came to the light companies and that's because they were the only nations that really had those dedicated light companies but most if not all nations had grenadier companies as part of their battalions although now i think about it actually maybe the prussians didn't now, prussians always have to be special snowflakes don't they now just as the light and the voltigeurs were the smallest men recruited the grenadiers were the largest and often performed the role of shock attack troops. Often their height was exaggerated by giving them tall hats to wear. So mitres back in the early days, or if you were a Pavlovsky grenadier in the later days, or bearskins, things like that. As the war went on, these tended to be replaced by shakos. But in the early days, the idea was to have those tall guys and to be made to look even more intimidating by giving them a big hat. Now, I poked a little bit of fun at the light troops and the fact that they regarded themselves as elite and their, their activities were those of elite troops. But I think, to be fair to the Grenadiers, there is more of a claim to this. Again, we're going to look at the French army in particular. And Grenadiers in the French army had to be veterans of at least two years' service and to have had the absolutely humongous, massive, intimidating height of five foot four. Or oh, that's 173 centimetres, which is pretty small, I have to say. But then, you know, pretty big for the time. Joking aside, though, these troops were considered to be the veterans. I've taken this quote directly from Napoleon.com, I think it is. Quote, according to the French regulations of internal economy and of infantry, section 9, article 1, issued in 1791, grenadiers are supposed to set an example of good conduct and subordination. They are always to be selected from the soldiers of the most distinguished and approved merit. Every year, on the 9th of September, a list of privates to complete the Grenadier Company is to be formed. 
Each of the several captains in the battalion will select the three most eligible men from his fusilier company to become grenadiers. These selected men must have been serving for at least two years and be at least 173.5 centimetres tall. That's five foot four. These selected men were assembled, talked about and examined by the captain, officers, NCOs and two senior troopers of the grenadier company. The captain of the grenadier company listens to the reports and remarks made, notes down such as appear to him founded and then decides whom of the selected men put on the list to propose to the commander of the Demi Brigade. So that's a company. The commander of the Demi Brigade, judging from the reports which have been given to him by the captain, will accept only those of the earliest selected by the captain men whom deem worthy of a decided preference, end quote. So there you go. You know, these guys were selected from the best of the battalion. Now, needless to say, this was, of course, the ideal. The reality didn't always match up to it and especially as the wars dragged on. These men were seen as a steadying influence on the battalion. De Seger wrote that a grenadier had a, quote, martial air. Nothing could shake them. They had no other memories, no other future except warfare. They never spoke of anything else. Their officers were either worthy of them or became it. For to exert one's rank over such men, one had to be able to show them one's wounds and cite oneself an example. I can't remember which one it was, but I'm fairly sure one of Napoleon's marshals, or it might be one of his generals, I think, I think it was a marshal, was a grenadier when they started off. I remember a an incident where the French were struggling to break through somewhere, so <laughs> the marshal himself grabbed a scaling ladder and ran out into sort of no man's land, and his staff had to wrestle him back. I can't remember what it was. If anyone can remember that, then please let me know in the comments. But clearly it shows that these grenadiers were seen as an example to follow. I said earlier on that unlike light companies, almost all nations had grenadier companies intrinsic to their infantry battalions. But I should say here, they didn't always fight with them. The Russians, Austrians, and I imagine until 1806, the Prussians as well, all had grenadier companies, whilst on paper were part of the regiment. They were taken out and formed into units with grenadiers from other battalions. These are often called converged grenadiers, or I, I prefer to call them combined grenadiers. And these would be held back as a tactical reserve, either to plug gaps in the line or to deliver the final hammer blow on an already wavering foe. For all intents and purposes, these were separate units, sometimes even separate brigades and divisions. So I'm not really going to talk about them here. In fact, we might do a separate video on them in the future. But that leaves us with the Spanish, the British and the French. Now, the Spanish used their grenadiers to create an, an a, quote, elite first battalion. Now, I don't put it in quotes because they were Spanish and <laughs> the Spanish are pretty dreadful. I say it because the grenadiers were were better than your regular troops, but not you know, a, a huge step above, maybe not half a point above. So they were used as the first battalion. They would be, you know, a bit steadier than the other two. Now, the British and French, however, had the same organisation as they did with their light companies. So all their battalions had a grenadier company, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, if you're the French. They all had grenadier companies as well as their light ones. And these would form up on the right of the battalion when they were in line. Now, the right end of the line is always seen in the position of glory, so that's why the grenadiers get to go there. Now, we talked about the light companies, why they were at the back of a French attack column. Well, it's exactly the same reason that the grenadiers would be at the back of a French attack column as well. They would be at the back on the right-hand side, and it was to drive the column forward, stop people turning back and running away, or just halting, to put the maximum amount of bodies between your elite troops and the enemy. And the third part was less important for the Grenadiers because they probably wouldn't be doing the skirmishing anyway, but they could quickly run forward if obstacles needed clearing, things like that. I should say as well, because I mentioned it about the Voltigeurs, in light infantry French regiments, the Grenadiers were called Carabiniers. Now it's worth pointing out as well that a battalion's pioneer troops i was to say pioneer company it probably wouldn't be a company a platoon perhaps their pioneers would march with the grenadiers they would actually be part of the grenadier company to all intents and purposes which means that when you're doing a sapper figure you probably should be with the grenadiers now i usually put mine with the command group but they would normally be with the grenadiers in reality and that was so they could get on with their work of setting up field fortifications or chopping down obstacles things like that knowing that they were surrounded by the best of the best who would look out for them. It's also worth pointing out as well that if that pioneer gets shot and killed, 
then the guy stood next to him who you know a minute ago was part of the grenadier company he can pick up that axe and start swinging you don't want your four foot six dude doing that you want your five foot four <laughs> mighty giant doing it instead again as with the light companies when you're looking at your sprue of figures you will see that a difference between your regular center company guys and your grenadiers usually for the british anyway there'll be no difference between them and the lights you can just sort of you build uh, build a guy paint his plume red because the grenadiers would have red plumes and he's a grenadier paint them green and he's light company the french slightly different of course they had a bear skin for their grenadiers certainly in the early days that then changed to a red banded shako later on some of the french aligned units would be slightly different as well the vistula legion their grenadiers had the classic french hat the chapka but the duchy of warsaw units would have bearskins now for the french units the front plate on their bearskin was exactly the same as the imperial guards but theirs had a grenade instead of the imperial eagle on there in fact uh, the, i think it was fuentes de honoro the british defeated a combined grenadier battalion and they thought they'd beaten the old guard themselves but the old guard were busy uh, freezing to death in russia at the time so uh, it definitely wasn't them again for the french you want to look for the cross straps to carry the briquette because french grenadiers would also carry the small sabers as well something that was absolutely obligatory for grenadiers and it also was for light infantry as well i didn't mention this on moustaches it was often seen as a as an elite symbol to have moustaches not in the british army no moustaches there but in continental armies moustaches were often seen as being a symbol of veterancy eliteness manliness that let's be honest so grenadiers absolutely moustaches the light infantry would tend to have the upturned moustache with the with the waxed ends think like poirot style moustaches whereas the grenadiers might have big walrus moustaches officers however would be clean shaven now in black powder the rules for grenadiers are they're, they're they are problematic i would suggest the buff that grenadiers give to units on black powder is a bit of an odd one because it doesn't look like they give you any uh, let, let, let me explain so a french battalion has got six companies including the grenadier company you get six attacks in melee and three shots now you are allowed to remove your grenadier company and form a converged grenadier battalion so that's fine but if you do you lose two melee and one shots so you're taking a negative for getting them out of there but you don't really have any positives for having them in there so take for instance the prussians they don't have any grenadier companies in their units but they still have six attacks in melee and three shots with no additional special rules so it's a little bit weird i've got i've got some ideas on grenadier companies i've had thoughts on this for quite a while i'm probably going to do wednesday's video on that and we'll we'll look at them then talking of combined grenadiers i know i said we'd talk about them in another video but i want to quickly cover them here and more the rules than the history of them the brits and the french have the option to remove their elite companies with the nerfs that we just mentioned russians austrians they have to they get no choice they are a separate choice in the army list and that's fair enough they, they always roll that way they always form separate units this gives you a unit that's better in hand to hand than regular and most importantly is elite five plus now that's a really good rule and one that i think is one of the most powerful in the game this is due to the fact that a unit that is disordered can't do anything it's a huge huge issue for them so anything that mitigates that even if it's only a third of the time is super super useful now, it also provides some reliability it means that even if they get shot up if they're spearheading your assault then there's still a chance that you can undisorder yourself and get back in the fight similarly if the enemy just do a speculative shot at you to try and take out your supporting units you can possibly still get rid of it rolling that five plus and get your troops back into that supporting position where they can help out your front units now this is both of those examples are useful if you are on the attack if you're playing defensively i can't see why you would ever remove your grenadiers the british in particular i would never ever do it i mean why you know never say never ever i suppose but i can't for the I, i've been thinking through theoretical occasions that i might and i honestly cannot think of any the loss of firepower and hand to hand is just too much for them for the french i, I also probably wouldn't either for the russians and austrians it gives you a really good reserve 
especially for the Austrians, because they don't have any guard units. Whereas the Russians do, they've got a guard coming out of their ear holes. At least for the Austrians, it gives you a sort of pseudo guard that you can reinforce your line with. Now, the light co companies can also form converged light companies, and that can form a thick skirmish screen in front of your guys. It's a lot more difficult to get rid of. However, you can get rid of it. You can't get rid of an intrinsic light infantry company that's skirmishing in front of its battalion. So for that reason, I would never detach the light companies either, especially as the rules for light companies as part of the battalion are really strong. As I say, we'll have a look at the Grenadiers on Wednesday. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. This has been a very brief rundown of flank companies, their uses, who had them, and how they are shown in black powder. I, I, I think, as I said at the beginning, I don't think it's any coincidence that the armies that fought the French-Indian Wars and the American War Independence saw the usefulness of light infantry and employed them heavily. Now, I just want to put out a brief um, notice, just in case. Next weekend, I'm actually taking part in a battle report for another channel. It's Triple Crown Wargaming. So I may struggle to get a video out this week. It depends on how busy I am at work. Hopefully I'll be able to, but we will see. Wednesday is certainly going to happen. It's just a question of next Sundays. So if there isn't a video out next Sunday... And for some reason, you actually want to see my ugly mug. Believe me, you, actually, you really don't. But just in case you do, then check out Triple Crown Wargaming. They've got a few videos on YouTube already. Drop them a subscribe. It's fantasy battle content. As you know, I'm, I'm a, a big fantasy uh, Warhammer fan as well. Not Age of Sigmar, the, the classic Warhammer. So if that's something that you, sounds like you might enjoy, or you just want to see my ugly mug, then ha drop over to Triple Crown Wargaming. Give them a sub. And I'll see you there in a couple of weeks. But that said, I'll be back on Wednesday. And hopefully we'll get a video out next weekend. If not, then the following weekend is going to be the weekend of Waterloo. So I may end up getting the video out that week on uh, Friday. Uh, obviously, if we've missed a week, hopefully we won't. But if we have, then it'll just mean that we get that video out a few days early. And it'll be on the anniversary of the battle itself. So with all that out of the way, thank you very much for watching. And I'll catch you next time.